Well, today we're going to continue in our series, Perspectives at the Cross, and today we want to look at one of the other unusual perspectives there at Golgotha or Calvary, the place of the skull. We're going to look at the perspective of Roman executioners and the Roman soldiers that took Jesus up to that place of the skull for his execution. Perspectives are so interesting, and one of the kind of sub-themes that we're kind of weaving into this sermon series is this thought that perspectives are artistic, and there, there are amazing things you can do with perspective in artwork. And so a week ago, as I was getting ready for this message, um, I drew this little picture, and um, we're going to put it on a screen. Can you see that? There are these funny little things you can do with perspective, and if you'd like to draw that particular picture, there's a tutorial for it on YouTube. And it's one of those pictures where it's like it kind of goes in circles and you can't figure out like how that's supposed to work out because it doesn't make sense logically because the, the shadows are all in the wrong places and the lines are all in the wrong places for it to be an actual geometric shape. So that's not really possible to make. Like if you had three or six bars of steel, you couldn't really make that because perspective is funny. And perspective can sometimes be a little bit confusing. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Have, how many of you seen the, the more complex pencil drawings that maybe have like a fountain pouring into a pool, and that pool pours into the next pool, and that pour pools into the next pool, and then that pool pours into the first pool. And gravity says water should go down, but somehow or another, it's all ending up back at the top. And you're like, how is that possible? It's because perspective can be tricky, Right? Perspective can be tricky. Several people can see the same thing and have several different perspectives of that one event. And that's what we see happening at the cross where Jesus was crucified for our sins. And so let's look at the story of his crucifixion. And today, as we, as we look at the story of the crucifixion of Jesus, I don't want to go over how gruesome it was and all the details of crucifixion. I want to specifically and very carefully just look at the perspective of the Roman soldiers and especially this Roman centurion, he's the only one of the Roman soldiers that is quoted in the Bible, and you'll hear his quote in the scripture today. We're going to start in Mark chapter 15. We're going to start in Mark 15 and read some of the crucifixion story, but then we're going to switch over to Matthew chapter 27 as we make our way through the story. So let's start in Mark 15, verse 13. If you've got version on your phone, let me remind you, you can take the version app, go to the menu, select events, and you'll always see an event for Livestream Church on Sunday morning with all the sermon notes that I'm preaching from there in the version app. And it's also helpful for your own study to have all the scriptures and extra scriptures available to yourself. Mark chapter 15, verse 13. At this particular point in the story, the Jewish people, the crowd that have gathered around Jesus are screaming, crucify him. They want him to be crucified. Mark 15, 13, crucify him. They shouted, why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. Who's Pilate? In case you don't know the story, Pilate was the Roman governor who was in charge of this part of Palestine in the first century or at the time of Jesus' life. So they brought Jesus to Pilate because he's a Roman and he has authority to execute people and they are knowing that if they just take this guy out and kill him, it's an illegal lynching. Does everybody kind of see the picture there? So they're looking for Pilate to condone an execution. And he says, what crime has he committed? But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. Barabbas was a murderer and an insurrectionist. He rose up with a group of people and he, they thought, hey, we're going to overthrow the Romans. And in the process of his insurrection, he killed someone. And so he is now in prison for murder and for insurrection. And Pilate's like, look, I'll give you this guy because this guy is not guilty. So they say, no, We'd rather have Barabbas, the insurrectionist murderer, than for you to release Jesus. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate did release Barabbas to them, and he had Jesus flogged, and he handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away to the place, that is the, to the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of the soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, they twisted together a crown of thorns, and they set it on him, and they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! 
Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid him homage. When they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes, and then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha. Then Matthew chapter 27, verse 34 says, There there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, this is the king of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. If you're the son of God, in the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling on Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus has cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and they exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. Today I want to look at those Roman soldiers. And I started all the way back in the the story that Mark gives us where they mocked him and they made fun of him and they ridiculed him, where Pilate washed his hands and handed Jesus over to be crucified, started all the way back where the whole guard was called together to take Jesus out to crucify him and, and read the story all the way to the point where this centurion, who is the leader of that group of executioners, makes that statement, surely this man was the Son of God. And I want to show you some things that took place in the process of the day. First of all, I want to show you that these people were conflicted. When we think about the Roman soldiers that crucified Jesus, many times we think, you know, they're, they're bullies, they're brutal, they don't have any care for human life, these are people that don't have any kind of biblical background, they're not Westerners like you and me, they don't think about people having certain kinds of inalienable rights, they're not Americans, they're Romans that lived 2,000 years ago, completely different cultural setting. And so when these executioners have the opportunity to execute someone, it's kind of this opportunity to do all the things that are completely immoral in any other circumstance. I can beat someone. I can make fun of someone. I can hit them in the head with a staff. I mean, we're just going to drag them up the hill, nail them to a gigantic piece of lumber, and leave them out in the elements until they hang to death. We might as well treat them like garbage because we intend to shame them in this execution anyway. And we can look at all the gruesomeness of the crucifixion, and and we can focus on that. But I want you to see that even in the gruesomeness of all that Jesus experienced, I think that some of these individuals that were engaged in crucifying Jesus were going through some internal conflicts. 
Pilate was going through some internal conflicts. Pilate is speaking to the crowd that's shouting out, crucify him, crucify him. And he says, I don't see anything wrong with Jesus. He hasn't done anything wrong. He hasn't broken any Roman law. And my job as governor is to enforce Roman law. He may have broken one of your laws, one of your cultural rituals, but I'm not part of your culture. Do you see Pilate's thinking? He's saying, I'm not one of you. I don't care what he said about God. I don't care what he says about himself. I don't care what he says about Judaism. He didn't break a Roman law. I have no reason to crucify this guy. Pilate was conflicted. Pilate had the luxury of washing his hands and saying, you take him. I'm not going to be at fault. I'm not going to be responsible. I wash my hands of him. He's yours. You do what you want to with him. But I want you to see this. The Roman centurion did not have that luxury. The Roman centurion was commanded or tasked with the duty of taking Jesus to the place of the skull along with two guilty robbers and thieves and crucifying them on those crosses. And that Roman soldier didn't have a choice. No matter what his conflict was on the inside, he didn't have a choice. He may have heard part of Jesus' testimony in Pilate's house, and he may have said, yeah, there's no reason for us to crucify this guy. But this Roman centurion, these Roman soldiers really didn't have any choice. They've got to go do this job because that's what they're tasked to do. And if he didn't do that job, let's say he's just really gracious and he found a way in the midst of all that angry crowd to sneak Jesus away, which with that angry crowd, there's no way. But it, if he could find a way to sneak Jesus away so that Jesus would not be crucified, what would be his punishment for sneaking Jesus away? He would be executed. Some of you, like if you messed up at work, you'd get fired. If you messed up at work, you'd lose some income. If you messed up at work, some of you might face some civil suit or something like that. Somebody might sue you because you messed up at work and would cost you a lot of money. But most of us in this room and watching online today, most of you, if you messed up at work, it wouldn't mean that you're going to be executed. But this guy, if he would have said, you know, I just don't think Jesus is guilty. I don't think I should have to do this. I don't think it's right that we take an innocent man up to Golgotha, the place of the skull, and crucify this guy that hasn't broken any Roman law with a bunch of robbers who have broken Roman law. I just don't think that's right. The Roman centurion had no leisure. He had no opportunity to make that kind of decision. You guys see where he was trapped? And I believe that even from the beginning, just as Pilate was conflicted, I bet this guy was conflicted. And as time goes on, the conflict inside of him becomes stronger and stronger. The conflict becomes stronger and stronger because he sees some evidence now that's starting to line up with what he's conflicted about. He hears the testimony of Jesus before Pilate. He hears the testimony of others, and their testimonies don't line up in the trial. He sees the followers of Jesus mourning him as they drag Jesus up the way of suffering, in, uh, in, in uh, Latin, it's via dolorosa, they drag him up the way of suffering, which is the road that they would take up to Golgotha. And they, these people that love Jesus, his friends and followers, are, are following along, and some of the ladies are weeping because they love Jesus. And here this man is further convicted as he sees these people weeping for their innocent friend who is doomed to die on the cross now. He's conflicted when he stands at the foot of the cross and Jesus has been nailed to that tree and he's been lifted and hoisted into position and Jesus looks down at the crowd. I don't want to drop my iPad. It'll end up in the baptistry. I've been thinking about that all morning long. I go like this and I'm like, if it falls out of its holder, it's going straight in the water. You know, as, as, as Jesus is lifted up on that tree, he says in front of the whole crowd, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. Can you imagine the conflict in this guy's mind now? That guy that's innocent, that I'm killing, is forgiving me. That guy who is innocent, that I'm killing, said, they don't know what they're doing. And honestly, I don't know what I'm doing. 
I'm conflicted. He's innocent, and yet I've got the task of executing him. And those conflicts are getting worse and worse in this man's heart and life. Then there's Jesus' words on the cross where he says, it is finished. What kind of person, what kind of crazy maniac at their execution proclaims in victory, it is finished? I did it. You did what? <laughs> you know, this guy's like, this guy's not dying. This, not, this guy's not dying for what I thought he was dying for. Hmm. So all these conflicts going on inside of this guy. Hey, some of you have gone through those kind of conflicts too. You've been conflicted. Like, who is God? Who is Jesus? Is the Bible reliable? Can I trust in what it says? Can I trust the eyewitness accounts that are written down for us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Can I trust those eyewitness accounts about the historical life of Jesus and put my faith and my trust in him as God's son, as my savior, as my Lord, as a God that will bless me, as God's son who is my avenue to a relationship with the Father. Can I trust that? And oftentimes in your questioning, you are conflicted. Am I right? I remember being conflicted even as a believer and having experienced God, experienced Jesus, and starting my walk with him. There are various times in my walk with the Lord, where I've been conflicted. Lord, help me. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to believe. I want to be more sure because I'm conflicted. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We're all people. We're all human. We all come to the Lord by faith. We're all saved by grace. And we all come to the foot of the same cross that the centurion came to. And we all come with the same typical, normal, difficult, painful human conflicts. That's how it is. But I'm so thankful that God in his grace and God in his love and God in his mercy, he worked with me and he's working with you and he's worked with you believers in this room to walk with you through your moments of conflict. Aren't you thankful for his grace? Aren't you thankful that he's so merciful? Aren't you thankful that he's so kind even when we're conflicted in our minds and our feelings and in our logic? This guy was conflicted. He saw the testimonies of the individuals that may have pushed him a little bit further towards coming to a place of confession, but then he saw some more evidence. He saw the sky go black at noon and he heard thunder that was not normal thunder. Anybody ever heard thunder that's not normal thunder? Years ago, uh, my kids, my twin boys, had their first soccer game. And uh, we went over to the little soccer field off of Locust Street here in Washington, Missouri. And we are going to watch these little guys play soccer for the first time. And they're wearing their shorts and their t-shirts. And we got our lawn chairs. And we thought this is going to be a beautiful spring day to watch soccer. And it started snowing. Now we're freezing to death. And we're sitting still watching them run around. Of course, they're staying warm because they're running so hard, right? But we're freezing to death. And then it's not really very overcast, but there are these big, flat, big fat flakes coming down. And it starts to thunder. It was like, it was fat, fat flakes, but not a lot of snow. But it was something enough to make it thunder. And I had never been in an experience where... I might hear thunder snow ever in my life. And so that was totally new to me. I'm like, what? You know, it's, it's like the fourth week of March. It's snowing and there's thunder. Uh, this is really weird. It's not a thunderstorm, but it's unusual thunder. And in this case, I think that the, 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 these people at Golgotha, they're probably a little bit surprised at the thunder. They were certainly surprised at the depth of darkness that overcame the whole land at that time. It was something God was doing as a sign to help people see, this is my son. This is my son that's being crucified for your sins. Then the last thing that he saw, the last thing that he felt, the last thing that he experienced was just this earthquake. The earth shook. Now, let's be scientific about this. Let's be reasonable. Jerusalem and the southern part of Palestine sits along a fault. 
That fault line makes one of the lowest elevated places in all of the planet, which is the Jordan River Valley and the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is like 1,200 feet below sea level, something like that. I probably got the number wrong, but it's way below sea level because it's in a fault line where two tectonic plates come together. That fault line actually goes down through the Gulf of Aqaba, and it goes down through the Red Sea, and that fault line continues in the eastern half of the continent of Africa, and oftentimes in your anthropological courses that you may take in high school or college, or in some of the ge geology courses that you might take in high school or college, you will study that particular fault line very particularly because there's some cool things that happen with that fault line. But that fault line is the same fault line that caused this earthquake when Jesus died. Now here's what's interesting to me. Earthquakes happen all kinds of times, right? But this earthquake happened at just the right time. It was at just the right time. And you can't schedule an earthquake, amen? Unless you're God. And then you can schedule earthquakes, amen? And this guy sees the evidence of the darkened sky, the thunder, and then the scheduled earthquake. And he's like, okay, something's going on here. This is not what I expected. And these conflicts come to a head as he sees Jesus breathe his last and then cry out, it is finished, when he dies. That's a lot of conflict, isn't it? But it brought him to a place of confession. And that's the second thing I want you to see. On this day when Jesus was crucified, there were all kinds of confessions. The crowds had confessed a week earlier, blessed is he, the son of David, who comes in the name of the Lord. The people in Jerusalem were worshiping Jesus on Sunday before they killed him on Friday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Six days earlier, everybody's confessing he's the son of David. Matthew chapter 21 verse 9 says, The crowds that went ahead of Jesus and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They were worshiping Jesus. Some people in the crowd said to Jesus, Hey, Jesus... Tell your disciples to stop saying that. Jesus, tell your disciples to stop worshiping you. Disciples shouldn't worship people. We're only to worship God. And they didn't see Jesus as God's son. And so they're saying, Jesus, tell your disciples to stop. And Jesus gives this amazing response. He says, if they don't praise, if they don't worship me, the rocks will cry out. You guys have heard that maybe quoted in the past, like, come on, church, we got to worship God. If we don't worship him, the rocks will cry out. That particular quote that we oftentimes use to encourage people to worship comes from Palm Sunday. Jesus is triumphantly entering Jerusalem just six days before he's crucified. The people are worshiping him in essentially a big parade. And Jesus says, if these people don't worship me, the rocks will cry out. Six days later... All those people that were worshiping him stopped worshiping him. All those people that were, all those disciples that were following him fled from him. And six days later, when Jesus was not praised and worshiped, and when Jesus was not followed, the rocks cried out. There was an earthquake. Isn't it amazing that it only took six days for Jesus' words to come true? Only six short days. Apply it to your life. Is it possible that in a matter of a few short days, a person who believes in Jesus like you might have someone speak some really negative things into your life, share some really negative things about your faith, try to talk you out of putting your faith in Jesus, try to talk you out of obedience to the Lord? Could it be possible that someone's trying to speak into your life right now to dissuade you from following the Lord, and you've got a confession of, I love Jesus. I've got a confession of, he's my savior. I've got a confession that I will follow him. I've got a confession that I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower, I'm a disciple of the Lord. But somebody's trying to speak into your life. Somebody's trying to persuade you otherwise. Can I just encourage you? You gotta be ready to say no to those people that are trying to persuade you 
to reduce your confession, reduce your worship, reduce your praise, reduce your obedience to the Lord. You've got to be ready to say no to those things. In six short days, these people were dissuaded by the false claims of some people who fed them lies. And they went from praise him to crucify him. And so God said, I will let the rocks cry out. The Sanhedrin confessed Jesus to be a criminal. Pilate confessed Jesus to be innocent. The sign that was over Jesus' head confessed that he was the king of the Jews. I think the Romans put it there to make fun of him. The rocks confessed that he's the son of God. I want you to see that the centurion confessed, surely he was the son of God. And Jesus had already confessed he's the son of God. Listen, there were some confessions that were going on that day. And some were false and some were true. And I'm so thankful that God in his love and mercy brought one of those guys that was being crucified with Jesus to a place where he called on Jesus. He brought that centurion to a place where he put aside his conflicts, and he confessed Jesus as the Son of God. Aren't you grateful for God's grace and mercy to help us, even in the worst of circumstances, even in the circumstances that seem the least forgivable? Who seems least forgivable in this story? Maybe the guy that led the group to nail Jesus to the cross. What are you thinking? You saw the false trial. You've seen the evidence, and yet you follow along with the crowd that's screaming, crucify him. And God is still gracious enough to work in that guy's life all the way to the moment that Jesus breathes his last. Isn't that beautiful to see the grace and mercy of God? I'm telling you, don't, don't miss out on what God has for you. God has grace and mercy for you, so call on him quickly. Run to him today. Confess him today. Let your conflicts be resolved. Let the Lord help you resolve those conflicts and come to a place of confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that every knee will bow and every tongue will ultimately confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. It's going to happen, and I want it to happen in my life today. Maybe you're here today and, and you're going through the conflicts and you're wrestling with your confession. I think God has grace for you right now, just like he had grace for the centurion. I'm going to invite the musicians to come to the front and I'm going to end the service just a little bit differently today. Everybody listen carefully. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray just a little bit. We're going to sing a little bit. We're going to worship a little bit. We're going to share communion together and then we'll be dismissed. But I've preached the first part of this sermon really short so that you have lots of time to let the Lord work in your life. I think there are people in this room who love Jesus who still have some conflicts in their heart and in their mind. I think there are people in this room who will say, oh, I've known God for years and years and years. But if you're really honest about it today, you'd say there's some conflicts in my heart and my mind. And let me just tell you something. Acts chapter 17 gives us a great promise. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 17 says that if we reach out for him, we'll find him, for he is not very far from each one of us. If we'll reach out for him, we'll find him, though he is not very far from each one of us. Some of you might be conflicted, conflicted about whether you should choose Jesus. You're conflicted about whether you should go to church. You're conflicted about whether you should be a Christian. You're conflicted about what you should have faith for God to do in your life. In the midst of all that conflict, let me just remind you that God is lovingly drawing you and he is lovingly available to help you. And so I'm going to ask you to make a commitment. Everybody say commitment. commitment. Say it a little louder. Commitment. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment. I'm asking you to seek out the Lord. And that doesn't mean do a Google search. How many of you think, I'm going to seek God, so I'm going to start with a Google search, right? We, we've become that kind of people, right? You can do a Google search, and you may find many good things, but you also find many bad things. You'll find some truth, but you'll also find some falsehood. So here's my big challenge to you. If he's not very far from each one of us, why would I, ser why would I seek him through Google when I could just pray and go right to him? 
And so my challenge to you is, if someone's speaking ill into your life, if someone's speaking something that's not faith in Jesus into your life and you're conflicted with that, as much time as you have spent on that conflict, would you, would you honestly commit to spend as much time seeking God in prayer as you have spent time searching out all the doubts? Would you be fair with God like God wants to be fair with you? Will you spend time seeking God who is available to you rather than seeking out all the opinions of mankind and all the things that they may say that might not even be true? Opinions from people that don't know you and don't love you as opposed to going straight to the Lord who does know you and still loves you. Come on. Everybody see what I'm saying? And you can do that. Say, I'm not good at praying, Pastor Paul. You don't have to be good at praying. When I became a Christian, I was terrible at praying. I couldn't pray three minutes. I couldn't pray three minutes. I'm serious. I didn't know what to do. And the three minutes I could pray, it was like, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Blah, 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 blah. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father who art in heaven. I mean, I didn't even know what to say. But I'll tell you this, if you'll seek him, you'll find him when you seek him with all your heart. Give him a chance. And I believe that God wants to solve some conflicts, not only for people that might not be believers before you came into the room today, but God wants to solve some conflicts of faith even in the lives of some believers in the room today. Because God loves you just as much as he loved the centurion whom he totally convinced and who totally confessed Jesus is Lord. Isn't that cool? He wants to do the same good thing for you today. And so I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet just so you're paying attention. And uh, in a few minutes, we're going to move around and we're going to pray. But right now, I want you to just stand to your feet. You're in the room and you'd say, hey, Pastor Paul, I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know that I'm right with God before I leave church today. We want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. And uh, so... I want to give you a chance to respond. Some of you are like, why did we turn the lights off and now turn them on? Just so you know, we got a little problem with the lights in the back flashing. And so, so they wouldn't do this flutter thing in your eyes. We turned them off. That's not the normal way. I like to see your face when I'm preaching. I can see everybody here now. It's so nice. Hi, y'all. <laughs> so, and you guys, I can see your face. It's so good. Um, but we didn't want those lights flashing in your eyes. Apologize for that. We're working on fixing the building. Now. You're here today and you say, hey, pastor, I've been conflicted, but the Holy Spirit's working in my life, and today I want to choose Jesus as my Savior. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know that I'm on my way to heaven. If that's you, we want to pray with you right now. Hold your hand up and look at me. If that's you, just hold your hand up right now and look at me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all. Somebody else, hold your hand up and look at me. I want to choose Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to know that I'm on my way to heaven. Thank you. Anybody else? I want to choose Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to pray with everybody, but now let me, let, me, let me ask a tougher question. I want you guys to be honest, okay? Look at me. Be honest with me right now. Maybe you're in the room and you'd say, hey, Pastor Paul, I'm so conflicted. I'm just telling you, I'm not ready to raise my hand and make that kind of a, I'm not ready to make that choice. I'm kind of wrestling with it. I'm not going to do anything to manipulate you right now. I just want to pray for you. I mean, I really want to pray for you. And you say, hey, Pastor Paul, I'm not ready to make that commitment today because that's not me. Would you like say, yeah, I'm not ready to choose Jesus, but I'm, I will say I'm conflicted. Hold your hand up. Is there anybody be honest enough just to say that? Like I came to church and I'm, I'm just not convinced yet. I'm still working on that. Anybody? Can I just tell you something? Um, Man, there, there's no shame in being where you are right now. God's working in your life. He loves you. And, and I'm gonna be, I want to pray for you, whoever you may be. And some of you are like, well, I, I don't even know if I should answer that altar call. But I, I just feel like it's, it's so good for us to have opportunity to be honest with ourselves, honest with one another, and honest with the Lord. And in a, in a gathering like this, we can do that. Yeah? We can do that. If you raise your hand, would you pray this prayer with me? And uh, we're just going to ask the Lord to forgive We're going to ask the Lord to come into our life. Uh, We're going to ask for his help. And uh, we're going to confess him as Lord. Okay? It's a very simple prayer. I want you to just pray this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, 
I know I've made mistakes and I need the forgiveness that Jesus paid for on the cross. I believe Jesus died for me. Wash my sin all away. Make me clean in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, put your Holy Spirit in my life so that I can live the way you direct me. Lead my life. Help me grow to know you more by your Spirit's power and by your word. By the help of believers, help me grow. Make me stronger spiritually. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God is good. Could you welcome some people into God's family today? Come on, put your hands together. God is good. God is good. God is good. I'm excited. I'm so excited for you guys. Good stuff. Here's, here's the next thing I want us to do. So like this guy, he's conflicted, right? And then he's confessing. What's next? He's commissioned. He had been commissioned to end Jesus, but in the, in the end, he emulated Jesus. He was commissioned to whip Jesus, but in the end, he worshiped Jesus. He was commissioned to crucify Jesus, but in the end, he confessed Jesus. He was commissioned to shame Jesus, but in the end, he submitted to Jesus. You guys see the transformation in this guy's life? And he's commissioned. And every believer in this place, listen to me, you're commissioned. You've experienced God, you've experienced Jesus, you're commissioned now to take that confession and be a worshiper. Worship God every day. Worship God every morning. Worship God when you come to church. Worship God anywhere and everywhere you go. Worship God. Worship God with your obedience and worship God with your words. Worship God with your actions and worship God uh, with, with the things that you say. You're to be a person who fellowships with other believers. Come to church. Get in church. Get in a church that loves Jesus and loves you. And fellowship and grow with the body of believers. Learn what it is to love people because Jesus loved you. Number three, you're commissioned to serve in the church. Find some place where God can use your talents, your skills, your abilities. Even in some simple way, find a way that you can serve. You're commissioned to serve. You're commissioned to grow in the Lord, not to just stay like you are. Like, well, I came to Jesus today, and now I'm saved, and I guess that's it. No, there's more. There's so much more to learn about God. There's so much more to experience with God. There's so much more to, to know about his nature and his word and, and his people and his grace and his love and his mercy. So let's grow in God. You're commissioned to grow. Everybody with me today? And you're commissioned to take the gospel to the world. Man, our mission is to tell everybody about Jesus. And it's not just me on the internet with the microphone. It's you everywhere you go. And most of the people at Livestream Church that are here today, they didn't come to church just because I invited them. There are some people that are here because I invited them. But, but most of the people at Livestream Church are here today because someone at Livestream Church invited them. And they told them about Jesus. And they told them about their relationship with God. And God used a person from Livestream Church to tell the world about Jesus. And you're commissioned to do that. Here's what I want to challenge you to do today. Will you take some time to pray? We're all standing. If you want to sit down, you can sit down. If you want to find a place to pray, kneel at the front. Find a different chair, kneel, be alone with God. Find a place in a corner where you just stand. If you need to walk around a little bit, I just want to challenge every person in this room. Take some freedom and start seeking the Lord and just spend time in his presence and say, hey God, would you heal my conflicts of faith? God, would you show up today and, and would you help me in the things where I'm not sure I believe? Would you help me in the things that I'm wrestling with in regard to obeying you and walking with you? God, maybe I'm conflicted about like what your will is for my life and I wanna know and, and I need you to speak to my life. If that's you, any of those things, man, can we just take time to pray? And I challenge you today, be a person that makes some room for Jesus to have his way today.